welcome to the early therapeutics and rare cancers uh, committee. Uh, meeting, uh, we have a pretty packed schedule and, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about 2 new working groups. Uh, the uh, sarcoma working group and the CNS working group. Uh, we're also going to review uh, where we are uh, with uh, the DART trial. And uh, Dr. Mita will give us uh, uh, finally an overview of uh, new drugs and early therapeutics. So we're going to start with Dr. Lara Davis, who um, is the co-leader co of the Translational Oncology Research Program. Um, at the Knight Cancer Institute in Argonne, and she is leading uh, the new sarcoma working group and uh, will update us on where we are with that. Uh, Dr. Davis, thank you. Thank you, Ray. And I am going to share my screen now. All right, so thank you very much. Um, we, I am, I'm Lara Davis from OHSU in Portland, and I am leading the, the sarcoma working group. Just wanted to give everyone a quick update on how things have been going. We just formed about six months ago. So we had our inaugural meeting in October. We've been meeting about every four to six weeks and uh, trying to alternate times so that, that folks can attend um, at least every other month if they can't make every meeting. And I do want to to just welcome everyone who's got an interest in sarcoma one way or another. You're you're absolutely welcome. This is not an exclusive group. So um, put the I put the next meeting dates up there. You can just send me an email, davisla at ohsu.edu um, uh, if you are interested in joining our group. We really were trying to be very multidisciplinary, and I think we are succeeding. So uh, as many of you know, taking care of sarcoma patients uh, requires uh, absolutely a multidisciplinary team. So we've got surgeons from surgical oncology, orthopedic oncology, gynecologic oncology, as well as both medical and pediatric oncologists and radiation oncologists all on the, the committee and participating. We do have a lab-based scientist who comes and of course our fabulous patient advocate, uh, Marsha Horn, who's been to each one of our meetings. Uh, so at the get-go, our goals were established that we definitely want to develop SWOG-led sarcoma concepts. So there are a large number of sarcoma specialists within SWOG uh, and um, and so we're, we're now have an opportunity within the, this working group to really brainstorm and move concepts forward that makes sense to be run within the cooperative network. And then in addition, we've, we've been getting approached more and more frequently about cross NCTN trials being developed through COG or ECOG or Alliance or NRG. And we want to make sure that we are championing those and also helping to develop them. So we have a we have this uh, two two pronged goals. We have discussed already a large number of NCTN um, studies. So these are the ones that have had formal presentations at the working group thus far. I want to mention them all briefly here. So first, the Alliance study. It is currently open to enrollment across the NCTN. So you can open this trial at your site and enroll patients to it. Our SWOG champion for this is Andy Livingston from, Memo from um, MD Anderson. And um, uh, it is for um, angiosarcoma patients with, either, with advanced angiosarcoma in either uh, pre-treated with a, a taxane or taxane naive are both uh, eligible. We then discussed, um, I've got these out of order. Uh, we discussed an alliance study for advanced uterine leiomyosarcoma. That is a study of olaparib plus temozolomide. This study is not yet open to enrollment, but is uh, at CTEP, so it is making the way. Uh, the SWOG champion is Rusty Robinson from Mississippi. If you have any questions or interest in, in 
uh, learning more about that study with uh, the PI is uh, Matt Ingram at Columbia. The uh, ECOG trial, which is a randomized trial of chest X-ray versus CT for lung MET surveillance is not yet open to enrollment. It's still under review at NCI within the Division of Cancer Prevention. This is an important um, NCORE study, actually, with uh, Ken Cardona at Emory being a PI. And our SWOG champion is Lily, uh, Libby Davis from Vanderbilt. So reach out to her with any questions on that study. STRAS-2 is a massive international trial um, looking at neoadjuvant chemotherapy for high-risk retroperitoneal sarcoma, um, in addition to surgery, of course. That is led by uh, Alessandro Gonchi from Milan and within SC NCTN, it's being led uh, through ECOG Akron by Ken Cardona. I'm serving as the medical oncology SWOG champion and Josh Mammon from Nebraska is serving as the surgical oncology champion for that. Please reach out to us. It is uh, open to enrollment in Europe and currently at CTEP for review with a goal of uh, opening across the NCTN uh, before the end of this year. There's two COG studies that we also have reviewed um, to help develop and champion. One is um, looking at newly diagnosed metastatic Ewing sarcoma using some uh, uh, testing the different maintenance therapies for, for after local control, an interesting design and looking at some uh, new, new possibilities. The SWOG champion for that is Rashmi Chu from Michigan. Um, it's currently at scientific council within COG. And finally, a COG study for newly diagnosed metastatic rhabdo. Importantly, all rhabdomyosarcoma subtypes except pleomorphic are uh, eligible. So this is alveolar embryonal and then some of the new, <laughs> new subtypes our pathologists are coming up with. Um, our champion here at SWOG is Mingguing Pan from Kaiser, and this is in final protocol development, so it will be opening uh, quite soon with probably this fall, if, if not sooner. So NCTN is very busy with, um, with sarcoma protocols, and SWOG is getting busy too. Uh, last fall, we heard from Miriam Lustberg uh, through the AYAA committee um, about a concept she was having for prevention of chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. Hari Deshpande from Yale is going to be leading a sarcoma cohort for that. However, um, this is a very early concept in development, and um, it will probably ultimately go through the um, supportive care committee rather than the, the early therapeutics committee. And th then our biggest advance so far is Dr. Michael Wagner from Seattle at our very first meeting presented an idea for neoadjuvant immunotherapy for angiosarcoma. And this is of course built off of the, uh, the um, strong signal coming out of the DART uh, angiosarcoma cohort. And so without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Wagner. All right, thank you. I'm just going to share my slides. Wait a second. Okay. All right, so uh, as Dr. Davis just mentioned, so I'll present a study that we're currently uh, developing in the sarcoma working group and uh, the sort of basic underpinnings of it have more or less been established, but this is still a work in progress. Um, and as Dr. Davis mentioned, this is a study for neoadjuvant treatment with either Taxol or the combination of Taxol with immunotherapy for patients with local regional angiosarcoma. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so just first, just a very quick background on angiosarcoma. So it's of course a very rare cancer. It accounts for about 1% of all soft tissue sarcomas, and patients generally uh, get a message to make PowerPoint full screen, so I hope that's better. Um, so patients will generally, oops, no, I didn't. Oops. 
this is not working, so I'm going to stop trying to do that. So what, can you actually see the full slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so then I'm just going to leave it. Um, so angiosarcomas are rare and uh, generally people will actually present with local regional disease. Um, a small percentage, about 15% will present, present with metastatic disease, uh, but most of the studies that we have are really oriented for folks with metastatic disease. And just because these are cancers of endothelial cells or cancers of blood vessels, they can really come up anywhere in the body. Some of the more uh, likely places for them to come up are in the skin, especially in the head and neck or in the breast, um, but they can come up in any of the visceral organs or even in the bone. Uh, and there are generally two scenarios where uh, we see these. Sometimes they can just arise in the tissue and that would be a primary angiosarcoma. Um, but then also a sort of classic presentation would be someone who has a secondary angiosarcoma, which is secondary to either radiation or chronic lymphedema. And sort of the typical type of patient who would get that is someone who had a breast conserving surgery for breast cancer, had a lumpectomy and radiation, and then about uh, eight or so years after completion of that treatment will develop an angiosarcoma in the breast or in the chest wall. And we're now learning actually a great deal about the molecular changes uh, in different subtypes of angiosarcoma. Um, the, there was a big effort that was actually a patient-driven effort where uh, a group led by Corey Painter out of the Broad collected hundreds of angiosarcoma samples from all over the country and even some internationally and did molecular characterization of those. And from that data set, we were able to learn that there's actually a subset of angiosarcomas that have a high tumor mutation burden. They tend to be the patients with primary tumors in the skin of the face or in the scalp, um, but it's not exclusively in that area. And sort of partially because of that data, we were able to get a cohort specifically for angiosarcoma added to the DART study, uh, which Dr. Patel and Dr. Chai will talk a lot more about later in this meeting. And the results from that were very uh, encouraging in that 16 patients were enrolled and four had a confirmed response. There was an additional patient actually with a primary tumor of the liver who had reduction in tumor size that uh, ultimately was not a confirmed response. Um, but particularly in that setting, it's really not expected that we would see even a reduction in tumor size with immunotherapy. And if we look at the patients who did respond, three of them had cutaneous disease of the face or scalp, which would be uh, in line with the molecular uh, data that I showed on the last slide. And there was an additional patient with a radiation is radiation associated tumor of the breast. So it does seem like uh, immunotherapy will have a role in the management of angiosarcoma, um, but there's a great need really early on to hopefully try and actually prevent these tumors from recurring. And right now, the treatment for patients with localized disease would generally include surgery as, as long as that's possible. Um, but just because of the location of these tumors, they tend to be very disfiguring surgeries. Um, so especially for the tumors that uh, arise on the face or in the scalp, uh, we'll often use radiation and then also uh, many sarcoma centers, uh, mine included, will generally give chemotherapy, uh, preferably before uh, the definitive local therapy. And we have very limited data to actually support that because this is such a rare cancer, but there is one paper that was actually published relatively recently, which is sort of the collective sarcoma centers of Europe experience treating patients with angiosarcoma. And they retrospectively looked at about 80 patients uh, who all presented with local regional disease and really just explained what the outcomes were. So most of these patients were treated with surgery and also the vast majority of them were treated with chemotherapy. The chemotherapy regimens vary just based on sort of institutional differences and uh, the treating physician uh, I guess preference, but sort of in 
in summary, collectively, there's about a 50% recurrence rate after just one year from uh, the local treatment. And then uh, there are even more recurrences after that. So there's really a great need to try and uh, prevent these recurrences from happening. And that's really the goal of what this study uh, is. And the study as proposed is a neoadjuvant study uh, randomizing patients with local regional disease to either paclitaxel or the combination of paclitaxel with nivolumab. And this is actually very similar to the study that Dr. Davis just mentioned, which is the Alliance trial, uh, but that's specifically for patients with unresectable and metastatic disease. And the neoadjuvant treatment on uh, this study would be 12 weeks of neoadjuvant therapy followed by definitive local therapy, which we're leaving up to the investigator to decide what the optimal local therapy would be um, just because of the heterogeneity in terms of location of angiosarcomas and then also different treatment patterns uh, across different sites. And then after the local therapy, uh, the paclitaxel group would just start surveillance as per standard of care, and the combination therapy group would continue with some additional adjuvant nivolumab um, consistent with other uh, similar studies that are designed like this. And as it is now, we will allow crossover for the patients who were randomized to paclitaxel alone uh, upon progression to then uh, be able to receive single agent nivolumab. Uh, the statistical design of this is it's a randomized study, so one-to-one -one randomization in each of the groups. The primary endpoint that we'll be interested in is progression-free survival, and this is a randomized phase two, so the alpha is 0.15 with a power of 85%, and this, these uh, statistics are all based on the assumption that about 50% of people will have a recurrence with just chemotherapy alone at one year, and uh, we're hoping or expecting to see an improvement to 70% with the addition of immunotherapy. And with all of those numbers, this would require about 50 patients per group for 100 uh, total patients, a valuable uh, across the study. And in uh, sort of extrapolating from the DART enrollment uh, accrual, we estimated that about three to four patients would be able to enroll across all sites uh, per month, which would require about two and a half years of accrual to fully uh, enroll this study. Uh, the secondary endpoints that we'll be looking at are sort of the typical ones, so of course, response rate and then overall survival. And we are working on incorporating some pathologic and molecular analyses, so specifically to look at pathologic complete response, uh, and then also uh, because of what we now know about the molecular heterogeneity in angiosarcomas, uh, we also want to look at the tumor mutation burden and see if there's any correlation in terms of response and survival for these patients. Um, so um, I am happy to take questions now yeah. or uh, we can wait however we want to do this. Um, if there are any questions, I think this would be a good time. And I do have a couple of questions for you as well. So let me let me just start. Uh, can can um, you just uh, remind me where the, um, uh, the so one of the cohorts of DART um, had an angiosarcoma cohort, and. Um, could you just remind me where the paper is and uh, just really brief uh, what the results were? Mind everybody. Yeah, so the, the paper is written and we're working on publishing it. So <laughs> it's uh, under review now. And I guess because of the open session, I'll, I'll leave that <laughs> vague. Um, but in terms of the results, so uh, there were four patients with a confirmed response. There was a fifth one with the liver primary who had a reduction in tumor size. But there are also some patients with actually, pro and I didn't even mention this, but with prolonged stable disease. Um, and there are now two patients who are actually still on study uh, with stable disease, continuing with the immunotherapy, and now two patients, uh, so two out of those four confirmed responses are now actually uh, CRs. Um, so one of those uh, became a CR at the time we wrote the manuscript. The other one was later. So um, those patients are still continuing on study and actually doing uh, very well. 
Any other questions? Do you think that the responders are like high TMB or something else specific? Yeah, so we have some data for that. So, uh, and Dr. Chai will talk more about the molecular correlate specifically for DART, but what we were able to do was get some clinical sequencing that had been done for these patients uh, across a number of platforms, just depending on what the uh, treating physician did. So things like Tempest Foundation, some institutional panels were done, and we had data for half of the 16 patients, so eight of them. And of the responders, so one of them did have a high TMB. Another one had what at least was reported as an intermediate uh, TMB, yeah. but also a PDL1 TPS of 30%. Um, and uh, there were five patients total of uh, who had cutaneous disease of the scalp or head. And of those, three of them responded. Um, so that was the group where we are more likely and expect to see the high TMB. Uh, and it's not a perfect correlation, but it does seem like those are the ones who are also more likely to respond to the immunotherapy. I want to I want to just jump in for a second and say uh, thank you very much, Michael, for not only presenting here but also presenting to multiple SWOG committees because. As we know, this is a very multidisciplinary disease. So uh, Michael's kind of taking this on the the SWAG Roadshow with the Rad Onc Committee and the Surgical Committee and the Breast Committee. So um, uh, we we really are trying to get everybody involved. And I also want to say that there is a question in the chat. Uh, so Adrian Victor is asking uh, what you think about um, using dual checkpoint instead of single agent. So that's a good question. I think it's a little bit of an open, unanswerable question right now. Um, and I, mean, I guess this goes along with, with many other cancer types too. Um, so it's very possible that just single agent PD-1 inhibition would be sufficient. Uh, I can't say that definitively just because I mean, we really just have anecdotal cases here and there. And uh, again, I anecdotally actually know of some people responding with just CTLA-4 inhibition. So uh, is angiosarcoma going to be just a, a different tumor from many others? It, it might be where CTLA-4 inhibition is particularly important. Um, but uh, I think that's still an answer to be determined and uh, hopefully, especially from studies in the metastatic uh, population, we'll get some answers. Uh, from, I mean, from DART, we're not going to be able, of course, to to get that question answered. Um, but hopefully, data in the future will give us uh, better clarity. So the original DART though was with the dual checkpoint. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So all of those patients that I was talking about specifically got dual checkpoint inhibition. And what's what's your um, expected time frame for uh, actually being able to enroll this many patients? Um, so, well, once the study's activated, we're estimating <laughs> about two and a half years. Um, when this study might be active is also an open-ended question. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Well, we're running really well on time and I wanted to thank um, uh, Dr. Davis for heading up this sarcoma working group. And I think it's a, a really exciting initiative and uh, Dr. Wagner for uh, presenting on uh, angiosarcomas, uh, which is an ultra rare tumor and just perfect uh, for what we're doing. And um, our next presenter will be Dr. Alia, um, who is now uh, the deputy director for the Miami Cancer Institute. And um, he's set, heading up our second, uh, uh, I think these are like children, we gave birth to two of them. Uh, one is the sarcoma uh, working group and the other is like the CNS working group. Um, and really both very important um, endeavors. And so Dr. Alia, can you, um, Go ahead and get started.
You may have to unmute. Uh, can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Kuzrod. Uh, you've been an amazing partner, and uh, you know we are the CNS working group, and we're a little bit behind Dr. Davis's uh, aspect, uh, but we are uh, very excited that we're actually having a uh, first meeting at the spring session, and then we do intend to meet uh, every six weeks or so going forward. Uh, so what I'll present today is some of the work that we have been doing, and Dr. Kuzrod has been extremely uh, gracious uh, in terms of uh, offering us, uh, you know, support from her rare tumor committee. So, as uh, uh, you know, Dr. Davis discussed, uh, our team is also very multidisciplinary. Uh, we all know cancer is a team sport, so you need all the surgeons, medical oncologists. We also have uh, people who are neuro oncologists, which are who are neurology trained with a fellowship training in neuro oncology. Then, obviously, our radiation oncology colleagues. We have a lot of Allied healthcare people who have interest since uh, you know quality of life is a big component of uh, neuro oncology or CNS studies. We have got basic science laboratory scientists, and then obviously we will be using support from the rare tumor committee in terms of statistical support when we get there. So I'm going to also highlight some of the uh, NCTN uh, studies that have been championed through SWOG. So the ones that have actually been approved in the last six months. Uh, include the Alliance Phase 3 trial, a post-surgical single fraction stereotactic radiosurgery compared to fractionated stereotactic radiosurgery for resected uh, metastatic brain disease. So as you all know, in brain metastases for the longest period of time, uh, when patients uh, had you know, resectable single brain meds, they would undergo surgical resection, which was then followed by a focused form of radiation called stereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, this was found at least to be as good uh, or, or better than whole brain radiation in terms of you know toxicity profile. However, we do know when you use single fraction stereotactic radiosurgery, outcomes are suboptimal. Local control rates are in the ballpark of 60 to 80 percent, and there is some non-randomized data saying that if you do multiple fractions of stereotactic radiosurgery, maybe three fractions to five fractions, you can improve this better. So this is the phase three design of this trial that is being led by Paul Brown out of uh, Alliance. Here uh, is the stratification. Patients who have uh, meds more than two centimeters, uh, particular, there are four different uh, stratification factors. They will get randomized to um, stereotactic radius surgery. Uh, 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 everyone will undergo surgery, and then you have, or you have the fractionated radius surgery, so multiple fractions of uh, radius surgery. And primary endpoint is time to surgical bed reference. Uh, this study was approved through the swab mechanism, and Dr. Chad Rastovan from uh, University of Colorado is the SWOG champion. Uh, moving on, uh, as a, on the brain meds team, uh, we have another trial, which is this time coming from the NRG um, uh, mechanism. And this is a phase three trial of salvage, uh, again, radio surgery or uh, salvage radio surgery plus hippocamp hippocampal avoidant whole brain radiation for patients with first or second distant uh, brain relapse after upfront SRS for brain metastases. And they're using this uh, concept of uh, brain uh, met velocity, and this is actually being championed by you know Michael Chan from Wake Forest, where uh, you know uh, when we give patients radio surgery, uh, we know that unfortunately since it's focused only the, to the macro metastatic disease, those, those are the brain mets that you see on uh, MRI. You have new brain mets that can come up. So the brain met velocity is defined as number of new brain mets since initial radio surgery followed by the time interval. And what we're finding out is if someone has a, a fairly high velocity index, that means they have new brain meds coming up very quickly. Maybe the thought process is that SRS may not be the best way to treat it. Maybe we used to we should use SRS plus hippocampal avoidant whole brain radiation because we all know hippocampi is involved in memory formation. So when we give people whole brain radiation, neurocognition is a big side effect. And so that's why hippocampal avoidant whole brain radiation has become a uh, uh, common uh, avenue uh, academic centers and leading cancer centers in the country do. And then people also get memantine, which decreases the degree of neurocognition. So this trial will compare whether uh, is there a benefit to this approach. Primary endpoint is time to neurologic death. 
moving on uh, as uh, you know dr davis had talked about and we uh, got a uh, heard a great concept from uh, you know dr wagner this is testament to the uh, amazing work that has been done out of the radio committee with dr skazrock uh, young chai as well as uh, uh, dr patel uh, driving the you know the dart trial and so we uh, out of swag for a while tried to get a uh, glioblastoma component and uh, you know had made several presentations to this group uh, meanwhile alliance actually got this uh, trial uh, approved uh, which was um, you know getting uh, uh, the combination uh, in patients who actually have um, uh, high tmb with glioblastoma um, uh, this is the uh, study uh, it's actually called um, uh, checkmate blockade uh, they're going to use both the combos and this is somatically hypermutated rectum glioblastoma uh, uh, the pi is uh, Gavin done out of uh, university uh, washington uh, university school of medicine and essentially uh, what it is using is something what we had proposed uh, when we were promoting the study out of you know a concept to ctab which was taking patients with a tmb of more than 20 um, mutations per mega base pair on foundation one testing and these patients are actually going to get uh, nivolumab plus ipilimumab uh, first 18 patients will be treated as we know you know patients with glioblastoma don't really have good outcomes uh, in reference actually uh, our patients actually don't even uh, have any survival benefit from any therapy so a lot of work can be done if any of these uh, 18 patients will have a response we will then move them to uh, nevo and uh, ipi uh, in terms of uh, you know outcomes um, let me go back to this trial that i actually uh, flipped over because i was talking about dart this is a trial which is again using a combination approach now ipilimumab and nivolumab and this is the nrg bn007 study here uh, we are going to go after the unmethylated uh, mgmt glioblastoma patients and here's the certification uh, basically we all know that uh, when we give patients who have unmethylated mgmt glioblastoma these patients uh, only get a 24 day benefit uh, with uh, our traditional chemotherapy with temozolomide so we give people nine months of chemotherapy for not even a one month benefit. Hence, uh, this trial is comparing radiation plus uh, IP and NEVO uh, compared to the standard radiation plus Timodal. And uh, both of these trials will be championed by um, uh, SWOG. Uh, now, uh, as Dr. Davis had talked about, uh, we also have a working group uh, which is gonna meet first time and I'm, I'm actually gonna go over, over three concepts that we presented. Um, um, I think Courtney Wall well, had uh, sent uh, the group here invitation. We are having a meeting tomorrow. We would welcome anyone who has got a CNS interest to uh, kindly call in. We'll be discussing these uh, concepts in greater detail, but just to give you some highlights or a flavor of what our group has been working on. Um, I, I, I showed you some brain meds trials as well as some GBM trials that we have been championing out of SWOG. Uh, the group is now going to work on a primary CNS lymphoma concept. Uh, that is going to be championed by Dr. Odia from Miami Cancer Institute. Uh, we all know Selexanor is a first in class uh, small molecule inhibitor of exportins. Exportins basically transports uh, uh, AIDS between uh, nucleus and cytoplasm. Uh, tumor suppressor proteins and numerous other things are transported. Uh, we do know that uh, Selexanor uh, does penetrate the blood brain barrier uh, and has got good blood brain parietation. We also know that Selexanor has activity in uh, refractory diffuse large B cell and actually has been FD approved, got the FD approval uh, last year in June, accelerated approval. Uh, there was an interest in Selexanor for uh, recurrent glioblastoma, and this was the King trial, which basically showed that there was some response uh, with this agent in the brain, also adding to the fact that there is uh, blood brain barrier penetration, uh, particularly in cohort D. Uh, we saw uh, decrease in almost 30% of our patients uh, with uh, glioblastoma, which was exciting. This was uh, uh, when the drug was given at 80 milligrams uh, weekly, the higher dose, more on the pulsatile uh, kind of dosing. So this has actually led to a national study, which is ongoing in terms of uh, Selexanol for uh, both newly diagnosed glioblastoma as well as uh, recurrent glioblastoma. It's called Export GBM 0 to 9. Uh, and um, uh, there has been some interesting initial experience with this study, which is going to be presented at ASCO of this year. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, we know that in uh, primary uh, CNS uh, lymphoma, primatexid is uh, often used. It has some uh, single agent activity in relapsed refractory uh, primary CNS lymphoma in patients who get this after the higher dose methotrexate. So this concept is actually looking at combining selexanor and uh, uh, basically primatrexid and we have had some uh, at least a clinical report 
where we had a patient who you can see in this MRI had a, a primary CNS lymphoma, got the therapy, and you can see a very nice shrinkage. And a patient basically by month five actually had a almost a complete response. Uh, and on this, we are building uh, this concept uh, that we would like to drive through SWOG. And essentially, we are using a combination of Selexnor and Premisexate. Uh, where we are going to use an induction regimen, the doses are given, then we'll uh, use a consolidation, which will be optional, uh, uh, and then we will basically be using maintenance selection hour. Uh, here are some of the statistics. In interest of time, I would actually welcome you to dial into our uh, you know, group meeting tomorrow to hear even more details about this concept. Uh, the next uh, concept that uh, you know, we are excited about is this uh, phase two study of atelizumab along with tocilizumab with the radiation in patients with uh, newly diagnosed uh, unmethylated MGMT. As I told you before, these patients only get a 24 day benefit uh, with temozolomide with nine months of therapy. Uh, so uh, there is a work uh, which is showing that uh, if you use the uh, anti-IL-6 antibody, you can actually have uh, prolonged survival in the uh, orthotopic uh, glioblastoma murin models. Uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, with the use of the uh, anti-IL-6 therapy, there is decreased uh, CD68 uh, myeloid cells, the myeloid receptor cells, and then there's an increase in CD8 T cell infiltration. Uh, and then there is work here. You can sure, uh, see that in uh, xenograph models, when uh, we combine uh, anti-IL-6 and anti-PD-1 approach, here you see synergy, which is seen here in the green, uh, where, you know, you see prolonged uh, survival uh, in these uh, mouse models. So building on this work, this is um, a smallish uh, phase two trial with uh, newly diagnosed uh, GBM patients using the combination of etilizumab and tocilizumab with radiation. Again, you can see recurrent, uh, you know, interest here, skipping the temozolomide, but adding these new therapies, particularly in unmethylated uh, patient population. Uh, the stats are one year overall survival. We are hoping to increase this from 50% uh, to 70%, we'll need around 37 patients uh, to do this. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we the GBM patients are either unmethylated or methylated. So while we are building, um, you know, the patients with uh, unmethylated, there is this uh, concept of TRC102 in temozolomide uh, in first line GBM building on work that came out of the refractory setting. Uh, basically, this was the effort that uh, you know uh, I was involved in, where we used to actually had a dedicated uh, adult brain tumor. Consortium. Uh, unfortunately, in the last mechanism, the CTF did not review a grant, but this trial was run out of that mechanism. And basically, this was coming building on orthotopic xenograft models, where this is a drug uh, called uh, 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 TRC102 or methaxamine that was developed by Stan Gerson out of the Case Reserve uh, Western Comprehensive Cancer Center program. Uh, and we saw that the combination of TRC um, uh, along with temozolomide had the best outcomes in orthotopic xenograph models. Uh, we also do know that we give temozolomide, the main two mechanisms of repair are either the uh, uh, 06 uh, MGMT DNA adduct that is repaired by the MGMT, and that's why patients with MGMT pathway, because this is a repair enzyme, they do better. The other pathway of uh, repair is the base excision repair. So this is almost inducing a dual hit. So you block not only one pathway, but you'll block both pathways of uh, DNA repair. Uh, so this was a phase two trial that we ran out of ABTC, uh, and uh, here were the results. They were not, uh, uh, you know, the trial did not meet its primary endpoint. As we know, uh, in recurrent glioblastoma, there's not even a single drug that has even shown a single day uh, survival benefit. So this trial was no different. However, uh, you know, as we know, and Dr. Kuznok knows this better than most people, uh, you know, we're in the era of precision oncology. So we were looking at our patients who were doing well, and we were collecting their tissue. So we in this trial had two patients who actually were exceptional responders, and you know we don't get responses in GBM. We just look at stability of the disease for a long period of time. So two of these patients had progression-free survival in addition of 18 months and 30 months. To give you a frame of reference, in uh, recurrent diabetes, median overall survival in recurrence is only around nine to 10 months. So this progression fee was even twice uh, that. Uh, so and and these were some of the outcomes that we found. We also found that patients who were MDMT methylated based on our hypothesis also had a very nice median overall survival, which was 30 months. 
However, when the, this trial was uh, put together through CTEP, our primary endpoint was overall survival of 30%, which we obviously failed to meet. But this, as you can see, MGMT methylated uh, patients, the median overall survival is 30 months, which is actually better than what we see in a front setting. So we uh, have this hypothesis that median overall survival with TRC-102 uh, patients along with tebozolamide and MGMT methylated appears extremely promising. And then what we did was we actually worked with um, Mike Behrens, uh, who's at TGen, and we actually did uh, uh, DNA uh, you know, uh, genomics, and we did the RNA transcriptome. And what we found out was there was a DNA damage response pathway uh, where we sh uh, these two patients here you can see uh, on the right, uh, they have a gene signature, and these were the two patients who did exceptionally well. One patient had what we call this as a borderline signature, who did uh, you know borderline well, just got progression before six months, which was the uh, outcome. So building on this, uh, we have a proposal of a phase one trial of TRC102 uh, in patients with newly diagnosed MGMT methylated tumor. So uh, as the patients will come through, the unmethylated will go on the tocilumab uh, and um, Italizumab, along with the radiation trial that has been you know, championed by Dr. Tony Wong, and the patients who will be methylated will potentially have an uh, avenue to go on this trial, where they're going to get a combination of radiation, temozolomide, and TRC-102, and we have two dose levels basically looking at uh, you know, this uh, uh, combination. So with that, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Kurzrov for her uh, guidance, her support, and giving us a home to our CNS working group. I'm very excited about our future as we are launching our first meeting tomorrow. I would invite all of you uh, to potentially join there. Uh, my email is here. Uh, feel free to send me an email if you would like to be part of our group. Uh, we are hoping that uh, you know we'll have fun times together because our field really needs a lot of uh, work because uh, pharmaceutical companies always do not have the you know most interest in driving uh, protocols in brain. And I think uh, cooperative groups like uh, SWOG can play an amazing role in serving this patient population. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Well, thank you uh, for the great presentation. Uh, Dr. Mahdi had a question uh, that we missed before, and I don't know if it's relevant to this presentation or the previous one, but if you, um, Dr. Mahdi, if you're still there, please feel free to ask your question. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Alawalia? I, I wanna say that I'm ex uh, very excited for the CNS working group. As you've emphasized, uh, this is a very, very difficult area. And I think um, this, uh, this working group can help make progress in it. Again, thank you so much for your continued support and uh, guidance. We are excited about our group. And we would welcome everyone for our meeting tomorrow if you have time and looking forward to working together. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions, we're going to move on to the next presentation, which is Dr. Yang Chai, uh, who is the vice chair for the uh, committee. And he is going to talk to us about CMEC and the translational uh, immunology in the DART study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kurtzkopf. You can see the screen. <clears throat> can you all see the screen? All right, um, so I'll start. So I will give you an update on translational medicine um, portion of the DART trial. We forged um, collaboration between CMAC and us, uh, SWOG. Uh, these are my disclosures. So we're going to talk about the objectives, uh, the elements of TM, and the recent evidence behind the hypothesis that we have, and talk about the academic and commercial collaboration that we have, uh, focusing on CMAC. So we want to replicate what we saw in other histologies, such as renal and melanoma, utilizing the nevo EP, which at that time when we first time trial did not uh, have much correlation with other biomarkers. So you want it to be histology agnostic trial, but then really use this uh, as a chance to learn about the rare tumor. 
So not only about the biomarkers of response or resistance, but really understand the, the genomic, transcriptomic, and proteomic and immune landscape of rare tumors. Um, so we're going to talk about genomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, immune uh, landscape uh, in four parts. So this is how it all happened. With the, it started as a MCI match precision oncology uh, medicine um, that was focusing on rare tumors, and that's when we proposed our trials. And this was the time when there were a lot of screen failures from uh, next generation sequencing assay. So whoever were um, unmatched or progressed and didn't have another match uh, <clears throat> treatment arm, then they would uh, fall into DART. So we initially had access to the NCI match um, data, uh, TM data, which is listed here. Uh, and and uh, now we have a separate swab repository because we were uh, separated uh, later on when the um, NCI match trial reached full capacity. Um, so the first section is the genomic traits. So we are focusing on PM tumor genomic traits, such as uh, tumor mutation of burden or uh, DNA damage response gene aberration, or in other words, genomic instability. Um, so I think it's a great platform because we have over different, uh, like over 50 different uh, histology cohorts in one trial, it's a true basket trial, and we're uh, able to test what we found, uh, whether what we found in immunogenic tumors can be replicated in other rare tumor types. Uh, this is a very interesting graph because this uh, is not looking at what a certain uh, clinical trial, uh, trial by trial, it's just the uh, understanding of TMB landscape in different tumor types and uh, the object response rates reported in immunotherapy trials in those histologies. So it's very uh, crude cross-sectional cut of the landscape. So uh, we thought this would be a nice representation uh, of our hypothesis where is there really a PAM tumor marker, genomic marker such as TMB that will uh, be uh, associated with response. And uh, looking at multiple immunotherapy clinical trials in different histologies, uh, so and Kettering group uh, have identified some trend that yes, overall survival can be predicted uh, according to uh, uh, TMB level. Uh, but this may be a phenomenon that is mainly driven by a certain type of tumor, and I'll get back to that um, uh, later, um, and this is the non-small cell lung cancer experience using uh, immunotherapy. And you can see here, uh, if you use uh, first-line nivolumab, um, which this trial really didn't pan out, checkmate 06, it, uh, if you look at the right side graph, the overall survival really did not change according to tumor mutation of burden. Uh, and then this is the lung cancer trial that used a TZO single agent. Everyone gets it upfront, and the response rate did change according to uh, TMB. Uh, with the caveat, this was the blood TMB that they used. Um, but then you you look at the overall survival, no really big difference in overall survival according to uh, tumor mutation burden. So is it just the effect of the early response rate uh, with no response, uh, no obvious um, uh, beneficial effect on overall survival. We really don't know. Maybe it depends on histology. And this is a uh, bladder cancer experience where really TMB high and low, you can see difference in uh, response as well as overall survival. So what we didn't see in uh, lung cancer was actually seen in bladder cancer. This is also the same uh, atezolizumab given as a single agent. So this is NIVO if it be early experience in non-small cell lung cancer where the benefit uh, uh, were found regardless of the PDL1 uh, high or low or presence or neg negative. And this is the pivotal trial checkmate 227 that led to NIVO if approval in lung cancer and there's initial reports showing that uh, it has major impact in high, high tumor mutational burden. But the later papers showed that um, um, 
the effect was really uh, also seen in both TMB uh, positive and negative, and PDL1 positive or negative uh, didn't have much impact in overall survival. And this is a subgroup who benefited from this NEVO EP approach. And you, as you can see, TMB high, low, uh, PDL1 high, low really didn't make any difference in terms of overall survival uh, outcome in this group of patients who received NEVO EP as a frontline regimen. Uh, so TMB, as of now, uh, remains as a companion biomarker for pembrolizumab uh, study across all different histologies. Pen is their cutoff, uh, and this is really based on the keynote 158 overall response rate being um, about 29%. And these are the histologies uh, that you could see you can see in that trial, which is kind of like DART. And this is by TMB, the response rate difference. But again, understanding that the, there is a collection of different histologies, there was no overall survival difference. Uh, and this uh, also uh, taught us, as with in many other trials, that tissue TMB and PDL1 are really not um, correlating with each other. They are independent of each other. Uh, so this is a very interesting article that just came out last month. High tumor mutation burden fails to predict immune checkpoint blockade response across all cancer types coming from uh, 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 Timothy Chan group, um, and what they had, what they uh, noticed was that the, you know, the I, I guess the reasonable expectation is if you have high neo antigen load in the tissue, then you would see more T T uh, CD8 T cell cytotoxic effector T cells present in the tissue, and uh, endometrial cancer, bladder cancer, you can see on the upper graph, there's a nice correlation. But if you go to prostate cancer, breast cancer, you really don't see that kind of correlation. So only in what they defined as a category one tumor type, uh, where there is that tight correlation, is uh, where we see the uh, impact of tumor uh, mutation burden high as predictor of immunotherapy. Uh, but in other groups where they where, where they categorized it, categorized as type two, they really didn't see that. Uh, uh, relationship, and this is uh, in different tumor types. As you can see, low TMB and high TMB, the response rates really did not change in uh, separate clinical trials. So this is really different than the uh, uh, the NEJM paper, uh, nice slope that I showed you. That was a cross-sectional uh, graph showing uh, a histology as a Aggregate, but this is just individual clinical trial. What what and that in that trial, if you separate them by low high, do you see correlation uh, um, with response and the differential TMB values? Uh, in if you look at the metastatic breast cancer glioblastoma in the uh, lower graph, you actually see uh, detrimental effects of uh, immunotherapy if you give give. Uh, Immunotherapy in TMB high group, which is kind of surprising. Uh, so they they did put these uh, category one and category two as an aggregate. Yes, in category one you see some benefit. Category two uh, you don't see a benefit, and for overall survival outcome, it may be even detrimental. So so stay tuned, and well we'll look at rare tumors to see if uh, any of these patterns pan out, and we will see. Um, uh, whether, you know, what their conclusion can really be applied into the DART uh, uh, trial. So uh, many interesting things are still coming out. So we are up to date on uh, current science. Uh, and we're using immunotherapy only combination. And the studies show that the TMB really is not predictive at all when you combine it with chemotherapy, and which is confirmed with a uh, keynote uh, 21 and 189. And uh, here, Histology really matters because small cell, yes, TMB, it seems to have impact on uh, on overall survival with uh, when you give NEVO EP. Uh, now turning into um, different pathways, you you can have a high TMB, but it, you, it might not have any impact if you have the effect immune effector pathway blocked by either JAK1-2 gene mutation, loss of function mutation, or beta microglobin gene required for uh, neo antigen sensitization or HLA class one genotype uh, is defective, uh, then 
even with MSI high colorectal, you're never going to get response. And this was what was published in NJM and uh, also by the Tony Rivas group. Um, and then we know that chromatin remodeling genes such as PBRM1 uh, and many others can play a role in uh, in uh, immunotherapy sensitivity. And also not all neoantigens are created equal. We believe frame shift in Dell mutations are very different than others. And uh, that is because this frame shift will create more change down the road in amino acid, leading to a dif differential protein folding, uh, making probably neoantigen more uh, uh, sensit uh, uh, sen uh, sensitized to um, a TCR. So this is uh, our group's uh, uh, observation where if you have frame shift in Dell present versus not, just that simple dichotomy will be able to predict res uh, outcome, response and uh, uh, survival outcome from non-small cell lung cancer patients getting immunotherapy. Uh, and then the TMB landscape usually does not always correlate with the uh, FS in Dell landscape. This is looking at all foundation medicine uh, patients that are uh, uh, sequenced. Uh, and then another genomic trait that of, uh, of, of significance that Dr. Kerdrak, Dr. Goodman had uh, reported um, is the PDL1 amplification, um, sort of extrapolating from what we knew from Hodgkin's lymphoma, 0.7% uh, 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 incidence across various tumor types. We, so we are we have created a separate arm within DART. This is the only arm that is not using Nevo AP but single Nevo, uh, and this is uh, the the um, JAMA oncology paper reported by Dr. Uh, Kerdrak's group and uh, response rate of 66% with uh, PFS of 15 months. Uh, we we are struggling to <laughs> accrue uh, appropriate patients for this trial, although we've kind of made it very clear. Um, I think we've had sites enroll uh, PDL1 high expression by IH, IHC uh, being enrolled into port. But it is, I just want to emphasize that this is the gene amplification or copy number gain greater uh, or equal uh, to six uh, per our standard criteria. But we are looking at germline as well when we're looking at gen genomic traits. Uh, and uh, this is also in collaboration with CMAC. Uh, and then the transcriptomics, we're looking for signatures. We're looking for the pattern of uh, uh, immune modulatory genes. And there are many different signatures that are out there. Uh, uh, and then we know there are, uh, you know, signatures that are out there. There are now clear certified, uh, Medicare reimbursable. So the field is really moving fast. And uh, we are focusing on Wnt beta catenin chemokine gene pathway, HLA transcriptomic expression patterns which already have shown to be linked to differential immunotherapy response. Uh, and it is currently being applied to clinical trial in a prospective manner. And this is one of the uh, uh, gene expression profile. And this is really the simplest one, which is just incorporating the PDL1, CFCL9, and interferon gamma, uh, just a three gene combination, uh, was able to predict that the high effector T cell signature was able to uh, be linked with a better progression free survival, as you can see in the graph, uh, which uses tezolizumab as a frontline therapy. And there are many other genes of interest, in, including epigenetic regulators. Uh, and then we move on to immune landscape. Yes, we are going to look at the immune cell express, uh, infiltration patterns. Uh, also interested in looking at the uh, MDSCs, uh, Tregs, B cells, macrophages. Uh, and then we are using the PDA1 uh, DACO 28-8 uh, monoclonal antibody. Uh, this was the one that we were used for uh, nivolumab trials uh, by BMS. And uh, and um, we are also um, scanning all these uh, images, uh, uh, and we do have plans to uh, use uh, digital pathology AI to. Uh, analyze the image uh, of these uh, immune cell distributions. Uh, and PDL1 mark PDL1 uh, is uh, uh, reported to be linked with overall survival benefit in NEVO uh, EP trials, uh, renal cell and melanoma experience. Uh, as you can see in checkmate 214, down uh, table shows that 
PDL1 positive group is the one that has actually benefited from NEVO EP uh, in renal experience. So very interesting interplay happening there. Uh, and then the proteomics, what's interesting is when we talk about protein, it's not really the protein that's expressed in tumor or to nearby tumor microenvironment, but it is also the host proteins produced by the host liver, acute phase reactants. Uh, and the mass spec uh, is able to uh, analyze the pattern of these um, uh, spikes uh, using the AI algorithm. So using that uh, MALDI-based proteomic signature, we could actually identify the ones, uh, 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 ones who have good survival outcome treated with nevo EP. Uh, in this um, uh, uh, presentation, so serum uh, serum host serum proteins uh, and germline mutations are really the host factors, uh, and then we do know that host neutrophil even like a, if you look at the CBC and you look at the neutrophil count and the lymphocyte ratio, we've all seen many many papers that yes those are predictive of uh, benefit uh, from immunotherapy and even BMI. Um, so there are host factors, and we we are learning more about the gut microbiome. Uh, we although we don't have that piece in our translational medicine, uh, but it is just the, uh, you know uh, just telling us these these also uh, tell us that the host factor is is probably as important as the tumor factor when determining response uh, from immunotherapy. Uh, so how do we integrate all the data we're going to uh, acquire from these, these uh, TM uh, collaboration? Uh, I, I guess the, the, the key word is or orthogonality, that these, uh, a lot of the predictors are independent of each other, and we really need to work together to uh, form an algorithm to understand and weigh different uh, variables to form a, um, a robust uh, predictive algorithm and understanding some are just bottleneck. Like I said, you could have TMB high, MSI high, but you could have a bottleneck that jack one mutation. You have it loss of function. You won't have any response. That's it. So, uh, I, I guess that's that there's gotta be an algorithm to weigh that factor in, in a differential manner. And these are the papers that have consistently shown that T cell inflammation, uh, expression profile. There's a PDL1. There is a tumor mutation and burden. Nothing correlates with each other. They are independent of each other. So uh, I think there, you know, clinical some of the clinical trials support that finding. And in the lung map study, SWAG committee, we have seen that Nevo EP versus uh, Nevo alone uh, in subarm of the lung map study. Uh, this trial was uh, uh, this this arm was closed, uh, showing no clinical benefit. However, um, the exploratory subset analysis showed potential overall survival benefit of NEVO EP over NEVO in patients with high TMB and low PDL1. So, this I feel like tells us that yes, finding the right group that will benefit from the combination approach is going to be the key. Uh, not everyone's going to be benef going to benefit, and it's just um, it's uh, it's. I guess the failure or the success of the trial will be defined by how we define the target population. Um, and that's been the uh, long experience as uh, reported by uh, Dr. Uh, Lezanova. And this is the the, the final uh, checkmate 2 to 7 survival that showed a benefit uh, regardless of the biomarkers at this point. Uh, this was so, so the bottleneck I said, uh, you can have all the good. Um, Interesting that uh, 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 immune, uh, uh, the pro immune inflammatory findings on the left part, but then you you can still have defective internal machinery if you have a genomic finding that that can uh, uh, be a bottleneck uh, for any immune activation. So I want to emphasize that yes, we want to look at the tumor heterogeneity, and this is talking uh, about the importance understanding the clonal structure. Is there are a lot of subclones, then you probably will not have durable response. So understanding the heterogeneity, not only the tumor TMB, those are two different concepts, and understanding those at the same time will be really important. 
So I think what's really good is that we have the pretreatment biopsy archived uh, and the three different time points, uh, baseline, first imaging, and at progression. Uh, so we want, and we're sequencing it. Uh, also, uh, looking at different change in cytokines, proteins, and from the tissue, we are imaging everything, uh, Im uh, immune cells to um, different proteins and uh, uh, sequencing RNA DNA. So these are the basic uh, TM uh, projects, um, which, which will mostly be, be done by CMEC, as you can see. We have two commercial uh, partners, BioD6 will be looking at the serum, a proteomic signature, a circular gene will be looking at the ctDNA uh, as well as MSI high in the blood. Uh, and um, apart from the industry collaboration, uh, we first started with Jack's partner and NCI, uh, the same lab that uh, NCI Match was using, but then we now uh, uh, partnered with CMAC, uh, chosen as their pilot uh, trial, and it, you know we're honored to be the first selected immunotherapy trial uh, for them. And MD Anderson is our main um, lab um, uh, doing the CMAC project. So as you can see here, cytokine assay, Cytof, multiplex IF, uh, multiplex IHC, RNA seq, um, and soluble serum biomarker analysis will be done uh, at uh, Mount Sinai. And we just recently got approval for TCR uh, clonality assay, uh, and then obviously a whole uh, exome sequencing will also be done. Uh, so the serum assay is uh, termed O-Link, and this is the uh, one that will go to Mount Sinai, and Cytoff is the one that will go to Stanford, but all the other pieces will stay at MD Anderson. Uh, so that's the CMAC uh, site number one, but they, they have their four different sites, and uh, all the data will actually be funneled into uh, CIDC, uh, which is uh, headquartered at Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, so we're very excited. Uh, we we have uh, our first cohort being um, uh, sequenced and and uh, analyzed uh, as we speak. So we've uh, um, prioritized group. Uh, into five different categories, but I can tell you the first three groups are our three at near endocrine. We started with uh, this is the very first group we reported the uh, the exciting response, <clears throat> and then we have separate pancreatic group, and then we have uh, 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 made uh, a separate high grade near endocrine group. So there are three different near endocrine groups. We're, we're going to look at that and run that group cohort as a pilot project and troubleshoot later. Uh, but then we plan to uh, analyze uh, samples coming from close cohorts that have at least two patients with objective responses and then move on to the at least one patient with objective responses. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone <laughs> for this uh, communal effort. Um, our, uh, our committee chair, Dr. Kurjrak, and my partner, Dr. Patel, and everyone, especially from CMAC, uh, who has been really um, on top of things, getting things for approval. There's so many moving pieces, but I have, we've learned so much from this collaboration and it's still ongoing. We're just beginning to uh, uh, analyze the samples uh, as we speak. So we remain very excited and very uh, thankful for all your collaboration and support. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do we have any questions? Um, I'm going to have some questions, but uh, first of all, uh, what you've done is like incredible. Um, and uh, hopefully the data will really help us better understand what is going on in these patients. Um, so I think the potential is just unbelievable. Um, I'm going to quibble with you on your TMB. Um, so the first big point I want to make is that we actually think that TMB is the single most important biomarker maybe ever uh, discovered. And um, uh, not to sound chagrin, but 
you didn't present any of our publications on that. Um, so we we published several papers um, on that, and I wish there was a screen share, um, but uh, it shows that pan the our papers show that pan cancer, uh, TMB, um, is actually. Um, uh, very strongly correlated with PFS and overall survival. And in addition, um, as a clinician, um, some of these patients have the best responses that I've ever seen in my life. Um, but what I do want to go back is to that letter in New England Journal of Medicine. And um, if you can uh, put that on again, I want to point out something. That recent letter that said that TMB may not be related, depending on um, because we did analysis of that letter uh, for I think it was Genome Web, and I did want to point something out about it because I don't think the the data in the letter um, is as clear cut as people are making it to be. Are you talking about Tim Chen's group? Yeah, the the forest plot. The Annals of Oncology paper, right? Uh, no, it's the New England Journal of Medicine, oh, okay. and it's the forest oh. plot. If you can put that back on. Oh, uh, seven. Yeah, yeah. I, I see let me right. just uh, point yeah. out something yeah. that I yeah. think is, uh, if if you, yeah. In this one? Um, not that one, the forest plot, which would be, I think it's the next one, the next slide. This one's yeah. the letter. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Um, so what I wanted to point out, if you look at the top of the forest plot, um, it's actually for all patients. Oh, that's just the bladder. If you look at the top, right at the top, that skinny little thing that looked at all samples, it's definitely significant. And um, if you look at some of the individual tumors, that's where you lose the significance. But if you want to actually, it's not on here, but if you look into the data, what you will find is that there, first of all, if you just look at it visually, they all move to the left, which suggests that they're moving in the right direction uh, for significance per uh per uh, type of cancer. And then if you go back into the paper and you don't show it here, uh, but one of the problems is that in some of these um, groups, um, the number of patients with high TMB is extraordinarily small. Like um, we're talking about 10 patients with high TMB. Uh, so even though the forest plot moves to the left, the confidence intervals are extremely wide. And I think they're extremely wide because the number of patients with high TMB are actually so small. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you're welcome to go back. We we actually did this analysis for uh, Genome Web, and you're welcome to go back into the paper. Uh, but I did want to make that point that overall they do show the high TMB is significant. That all the force plots lean to the left, and that if you go into the details, the number of patients is exceedingly small in some of these groups um, in the subset of patients with high TMB. So that's um, that's my quibble um, with with that New England Journal of Medicine um, letter. Um, and maybe why it ended up being a letter, um, but um, uh, I'll stop there. But but overall, I love this effort. TMB is not going to be a single marker. Um, it's just that we really um, our data show it's such a strong marker, at least for uh, for uh, anti PD one PDL one by itself. Yes, thank you for the great comment. Yes, uh, I, I do think TMB. I is a um, pan tumor marker, um, and I, I kind of envision this as something th similar to MSI high. Like if you're above certain threshold, um, it is truly strong biomarker. Unless you you get the bottleneck that I discussed, but then uh, let's say TMB low. Having if you belong to that category, like if you're like already like low group. Um, having low, low or low, high, that kind of differential, like uh, difference, does not impact 
patient outcome uh, on immunotherapy. I think I, I've looked at, uh, for instance, like if you have MSI stable, does it matter if your MSI score, the number defined by, I, I used the Mantis, Mantis score, but you know, how does that impact survival or any, any immune infiltration difference? The answer was no. Uh, but I'm thinking, yes, very TMB, if it's really high, it's going to drive the graph to the left side and so thereby being a strong predictor. But if you belong to the low group, then, you know, that the, the, the small difference between um, different tumors and TMB level is not going to affect, you know, in a continuous variable manner. So, 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 so what I want to say is we did publish in cancer immunology research about uh, probably about 2 years ago, where we looked at um, microsatellite stable patients with TMB high and clearly they respond just as if they're microsatellite unstable it makes no difference at all. Now, where uh, the other thing that we found was that there was a linear correlation between TMB and response. And I think um, what one could quibble about is should the cutoff be a 10? Um, like, what about the patients by, between 10 and 20? Um, and, uh, you know, our personal experience is that there's responders there. Um, there's just not a lot of responses, responders there. That the responders in the uh, TMB 10 to 20 may be about 15%. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you start to get over 20, now you start to get much higher response rates, actually north of 40%. Um, and, and then the question is, should patients with a 15% uh, percent, uh, response rate have access to the drug? And, and my own concern is, because we've definitely seen responses. Uh, we just reviewed a patient uh, with actually pancreatic cancer who had a TMB 11 and uh, 33 months ongoing response. But, but, but I think the thing is um, that, that I, what I worry about is if the threshold goes higher, uh, the only people that, so what what will happen is that people that have the means will still get the drug and people that don't have the means uh, will no longer get the drug with the 15% response rate. And certainly we do um, approve a lot of drugs with 15%, actually a lot lower, um, like Lonserf, my favorite drug, 1.5% response rate. Um, <laughs> and it's true. Um, any rate, so there's some questions here. Uh, or other questions. Anybody want to ask any questions? Okay, so um, in that light, I think we need to move on. Uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Chai, again, I think um, this is phenomenal. Um, this will form a TCGA of, of rare cancers and the ability to really integrate multiple markers into uh, the nevo ipi paradigm. So I know you've put an enormous amount of work into this, and um, I, I think we all appreciate it. Uh, so the next speaker is Dr. Sandeep Patel, um, who is the PI of the DART uh, trial, and he's going to tell us uh, where um, where we are with this. I think you're you're you might may be muted, Dr. Patel. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and, and hopefully, are, are my slides showing okay? Yes, the slide looks good. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and so uh, hard to follow all these uh, excellent uh, talks and discussions, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, my related disclosures, probably the most pertinent, um, relates to to BMS. Uh, though um, well, I won't be discussing any off label use. And so. Just want to go back a bit into the genesis around the DART study. You've heard some interesting results um, as well as some of the translational work. Why even bother to do the study in the first place? Uh, and, and really, this is the, the reason why. So individually rare cancers are, are obviously rare by definition, um, but in aggregate, um, they represent about a quarter of cancer burden. Um, in addition to that, 
um, rare cancers are actually more frequent than more common cancers until about age 40. And so if you're a younger patient, you're actually much more likely to have a rare cancer uh, than a common cancer, which is counterintuitive, but makes sense when you think about the most common cancer types like prostate cancer, um, ER positive breast cancer, um, and so on that develop kind of at, a, at an older age. Uh, one historical issue with the conduct um, of rare tumor studies is that they are very heterogeneous um, in terms of the primary sites. Um, we see here hematologic malignancies are uh, roughly a quarter, um, gynecologic tumors, head and neck tumors, and I'll be talking in particular about neuroendocrine cancers. And, and so the study started um, a little over four years ago and initially started with uh, 37 tumor types um, as listed here and um, was the first and, and to my knowledge still the only federally funded uh, rare tumor immunotherapy basket study. And so the genesis of its design really related to some of the really important work that's been done showing that we have anti-PD-1 directed responses in rare cancers. Um, we see pembrolizumab Merkel cell, which is um, a study that was led by our uh, SWOG colleagues at the Hutch, um, nivolumab in uh, anal cancer, a study um, led by uh, Dr. Kathy Yang, who's um, the, the lead leader of our, the SWOG GI group. And then the idea was if we're gonna do a signal finding study, uh, should we go with combinatorial immune checkpoint blockade? Because we may never get a second chance to look at some of these cancers in terms of response to immune checkpoint blockade. And so uh, in its current form, uh, S69 DART uh, is 52 cohorts, uh, 765 patients accrued to date. It's a Simon two stage design um, by Resist 1.1. Um, as time has progressed, iResist has been found to be less important than using conventional Resist, but allowing for continued um, treatment uh, for patients with clinical benefit, which we um, permit, of course. Um, and then our dosing schema, which is ipilimumab one milligram per kilogram every six weeks and nivolumab um, 240 milligrams every two weeks, which um, at the time of the study design was a more novel combinatorial approach, though increasingly we've seen this utilized within thoracic malignancies um, as well as other cancer types as well as, as a balance of efficacy and toxicity. And so this is the website, it's publicly accessible to everyone um, as of uh, today. Uh, 765 accruals, 52 cohorts, um, and you can see where the accruals fall amongst the different uh, cohorts. And I want to focus a bit on, on one cohort of interest. You heard some of the great work being done in angiosarcoma um, and uh, in the translational space, and I want to focus a bit on neuroendocrine neoplasms. Uh, th there's really represented metonymy of rare cancers in the sense that uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms are also heterogeneous rare tumors that occur, uh, occur throughout the body. They have variable biologies um, going from low-grade, well-differentiated, which is very relatively indolent tumors that can uh, have survival in the metastatic setting measuring years, or poorly differentiated high-grade tumors, which are aggressive, um, not dissimilar from small cell lung cancer, with survival really measured in months uh, with a very aggressive biology. Um, the classification scheme, I think, uh, to say is complex would be an understatement. It's undergone multiple revisions, um, even during the conduct of the study in terms of WHO criteria, but broadly, uh, low-grade tumors don't have cells that divide a lot, and high-grade tumors have a lot of cells that are constantly dividing, and how we define them, how we measure, and how the pancreas is different is a bit in flux, but that's the general concept. And, and so the general concept behind the neuroendocrine cohort um, really relates uh, to uh, the, the prior studies, which showed um, a response rate about 5% for anti-PD-1-directed uh, monotherapy. These are the bispartalizumab studies. Um, and so this obviously is unique in this being a combinatorial approach. Um, we, in this cohort, we had 32 eligible patients, and I, and I want to specify that at this time, the pancreatic neuroendocrine cohort uh, was separate uh, because it was felt to be a, a different biology. This court looked at all comers, right? So you could have low grade or high grade bi biology as measured earlier. A little over half the patients here, 56% had high grade biology. And the primary site typically tended to be GI, long um, unknown primary, uh, median number of lines of therapy was two. And, and these are demographics, an older patient population, you know, age 60. Um, performance status, typically one was the most common. You see the variety of primary sites um, and you see high grade represented a little over half of the patients we saw. And that some patients had seven prior lines of therapy, which is a heavily pre-treated population. 
And if we look at response rate, if you try to um, d discern a difference based on primary site, we really don't see that here in terms of the waterfall plot. But you see that patients with high grade biology uh, tended to have better response. Now, um, of course, patients, there are some patients here on the far left. Uh, with high grade biology, who had aggressive disease, for which this therapy didn't work, and they unfortunately had rapid progression. And one of the translational aims related to what Dr. Um, che was referring to um, is trying to understand why. And one of the salient aspects of uh, cancer immunotherapy is the potential for durable responses. And we see here um, denoted um, in the, the rows that have triangles with the ongoing arrows for ongoing responses, that patients with high-grade disease not only respond, but those responses are measured uh, on the order of over a year, now years. Um, and, and I've had the privilege of taking care of some of these patients here at UCSD, and it really is uh, uh, amazing to see um, uh, the, their responses and the durability they're in. And so when we look at the overall efficacy in terms of the objective response rate, about a 44% um, response rate, but this is uh, amongst all comers and looking retrospectively at high grade. So it's not a pre-specified subgroup analysis. And in looking at pulmonary versus non-pulmonary, you see the response rates range from 40 to 66%. Um, and if you look just at the GI high-grade tumors, it's about 25%. Um, clinical benefit rate, almost half of patients with high-grade biology had benefit, maybe 14% low-grade, but maybe that's related to the indolent biology. And then you see um, that it's not only the response, but the durability, right? Because with high-grade disease, with platinums, we get responses, but it's the durability that's the issue. And so what about toxicity when we combine two immunotherapeutics? Uh, we see here that fatigue and nausea are the most common, uh, though in terms of re immune-related uh, adverse events, hypothyroidism and liver dysfunction were the most common. Uh, we had one high-grade colitis, uh, no, no pneumonitis, and, and no grade 5 toxicities in our cohort. Uh, and so what are the limitations of our study? There was no central pathology review. Uh, we relied on local pathology reports, uh, mitotic rate, KI-67, uh, the translational studies um, through CMAX, Dr. Chai um, mentioned, and, and it was a local adjudication of organ of origin. Uh, we didn't have a way of verifying um, centrally uh, the primary site. And frankly, um, primary site is actually very difficult to verify, even if you have the, the full block, uh, which we, we do have these tissues. And as mentioned, um, it was not a pre-specified analysis for high grade versus low grade. It was a single arm study. It was not randomized. Uh, we do have a formal cohort, which I'm going to talk about momentarily. And so this, if amongst all comers with neuroendocrine cancer, regardless of grade, we saw the signal. What if we just prospectively enroll a totally different cohort with new patients uh, with high grade neuroendocrine cancer to see what the true response rate is in a prospective unselected manner? Uh, um, and so we had 19 patients um, in this distinct cohort. All patients were microsatellite stable. This was confirmed. Uh, and our objective response rate, and this is just published in Cancer, uh, was 26%. So on the, the lower end, what we saw in the GI, um, uh, the GI cohort, uh, but the lower end of the confidence interval for what we expected um, from the prior results. But the six month PFS rate was still robust, and many of the patients had durable um, emissions, including partial emissions. And again, the toxicities. Uh, recapitulated our prior experience, uh, though rash was more common in our cohort, uh, but no grade five toxicities. And so to get um, in, into the details, um, uh, in terms of the high grade immune toxicities, about 15% of patients had high grade immune mediated rash, 10% uh, had elevated lipase, but no pancreatitis. And as mentioned, 26% uh, confirmed partial response uh, with an additional 5% uh, with stable disease. And given that this is high grade neuroendocrine cancer, uh, I would argue um, that stable disease for greater than six months reflects more the treatment than the underlying biology because high grade um, neuroendocrine is more like small cells, very rapid progression. So um, you know, my view is this is probably closer to a 31% uh, response rate. And, and in, in my own hands, I feel like about one in three patients with high grade disease response. I think that's consistent. Once again, we didn't see across um, uh, histologies really one way of discerning which patients respond or not, even some amongst the high grade. Um, but that amongst the responsors, we have patients with these atypical lung neuroendocrine cancers, GI primary, rectal esophageal. Um, and, and so really, uh, if you look, it's, uh, cancer does not read the playbook on what organ it comes from, but really it's underlying molecular biology or immunobiology in this case, and that's what we see here. 
And so broadly about the study of 1609 is the first um, NCI funded rare tumor immunotherapy basket study. Uh, over 52 rare tumor uh, subtypes, 765 patients have been treated on study. Uh, Nonocrine uh, in a retrospective manner showed a promising signs of activity for hybrid uh, carcinoma, about 44% response rate. We created a prospective cohort to look at this um, with a 26% objective response rate. But I actually think, you know, if you count the stable disease, which is meaningful in high grade disease, I don't think that's underlying biology for those patients. If you're taking care of that patient group, it's probably closer to 31%, so about one in three patients. I think the other impressive aspect about it is we had the 21 accruals in the span of two months. And so um, one of the important lessons, at least for me from S1609, is that uh, clinical trials in rare tumors are feasible. There's this uh, unusual tautology, tautologic argument where, oh, we can't do rare tumor clinical trials because they don't accrue, but they don't accrue because we don't do them. And, and so I think this shows that um, if we do the study, um, the patients are out there and they're interested um, in enrolling. And, and the other aspect is, you know, we think, oh, uh, you know, here in the ivory tower, we're the only ones who've seen a case of this in the past year, you know, they're all coming to us, but almost two thirds of the accruals were in the community setting and the majority of the patients are out there. And so if we open a study that's of interest to patients, even if it's rare cancers, and we make sure the trial is available to where the patients are in the community setting, which the NCORP program has done a phenomenal job of, we can conduct these studies and help these patients and meet them where they are. Um, we've had a uh, robust accrual across all these cohorts and, um, I know, and actually Dr. Wagner discussed, uh, the remainder. So I'll just go to my thank you slide. I did want to briefly discuss Dr. Adams has a metaplastic breast cohort, uh, that, um, is impressed and, and, and is, is very much worthy of, of further discussion. And then Dr. Chai, of course, mentioned our CMAX collaborations, but really wanted to focus in on, on the, the, the thank you slide, really to everyone who's been involved and most of all the patients uh, and their caregivers and, and happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, so that is really, uh, this study has been phenomenal, Dr. Patel, and really uh, thank you for leading it. Um, uh, so, um, I did want to mention something about the metaplastic. So I'm glad that you, uh, brought that up. Uh, uh, Sylvia Adams did a great job of putting it together and, uh, something that I find personally really interesting, and maybe you could comment on it is that the metaplastic was, uh, different than, let's say the neuroendocrine. Uh, with the neuroendocrine, there were a uh, spectrum of responses, you know, from really great responses to lukewarm responses to no responses. In the metaplastic, uh, three out of 17, I think it was 17 patients responded, uh, but it was like all or nothing. All of these were super responses. All are ongoing at two or three years. So it, it was either... Uh, no response whatsoever, or this exceptional response. And um, I think Dr. Chai's work uh, with CMAC may help elucidate that, but I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a great point. And um, if I recall, you've actually published, right? This is the, doc, is this the Dr. Seuss um, triplets? Is this the same uh, disease that you developed? Yeah, it is Dr. Bible? Seuss triplets, but Dr. Seuss didn't include immunotherapy. Uh, so that's doxylvastin and torosil. Uh There were DAT, SAT, CAT, PAT, and so forth. But one of them, and and DAT does have activity in um, metaplastic, and probably we know now because uh, some of them have uh, p53 mutations and mutations in the uh, mTOR pathway. But um, that's a little different than the immunotherapy, where uh, you've got a small subset that respond and they're all phenomenal responses. None of them are lukewarm. They're all phenomenal or you get nothing. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. My pet theory, and, and we'll see what pans out in these uh, analyses, is a lot of our best neoantigens are cancer testes antigens, right? They're actually cell therapies that look at this like MAJ, NYESO, and metaplastic is on the teratoma spectrum, right? It's a multi-lineage type tumor. It's very different, de differentiated. So I'm very curious if in the CMAX analyses, we find 
that um, maybe it's high true rotational burden or high PDL1, but it could also just be that the types of neoantigens that are being made because of the or, uh, origin of the tissue is such that it's it's more likely to respond. But I think we're, we're just going to have to see the historical data. Um, you know, from this in terms of TMB and PDL1, is this is a, a lower a mutational burden tumor for most patients. But I think that's the other question, kind of your comments earlier on if that's another biomarker that's discerning a response versus a non response in this cohort. Yeah, I think we have no idea. Are these just like really high mutational burden patients, or do, is there a specific uh, neoantigen? Um, in these patients, I mean, your point is really well taken, uh, but uh, this dichotomization um, to all or nothing is a little unusual and definitely different than neuro the neuroendocrine or some of the other tumor types where um, we see a spectrum of responsiveness. Okay, thank you. That was really excellent. And our last talk will be by uh, Dr. Mita who always does an excellent job in uh, updating us on new drugs in oncology. And um, she co-leads the uh, experimental therapeutics program at Cedar sinai uh, Hi, um, I'm gonna start, try to share my screen. Thank you so much for the invitation again. And um, seems like I have some problems sharing my screen. Sorry for that. Maybe I don't know. Um, if you want, I can share your slides. Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you so much. Okay, one moment. So I would just um, like to start by, you know, telling again that these are the drugs that I'm presenting um, for a certain number of years now are drugs that I actually work with in the clinic and I find um, this um, new drugs extremely interesting. Um, so um, I also would like it to be really great to hear from other participants and um, other doctors that are involved in phase one studies to see what they have interesting in their pipeline um, internally and see if we can combine some of the presentations or you know discuss about new drugs. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so maybe I can. Can you please um, move the slide? Okay, thank you. So I'll go pretty fast on the next few slides because that was just a reminder of what we discussed about in the last several years. So we started in 2014 and we talked about CDK inhibitors and uh, the immune therapies just were coming and we talked about immune conjugates, all these were approved, but also others like targeting cancer stem cell and nanoparticles and different other technologies. Um, next slide, please. So in 2015, we discussed about proapoptotic therapies, PA3K pathway and inhibitors, FGFR inhibitors. All these drugs have been approved since then. And then we still um, discuss antiangiogenic treatments, cancer stem cells, novel proteasome inhibitors. These are not yet approved. Um, next, please. In um, 2015, we looked again at prop. Oh, I'm sorry. Next. Um, we look at hedgehog inhibitors, we inhibit their MAT pathway inhibitor, and then we had a full session dedicated to immune therapy because uh, a lot of new elements and information were coming at that time regarding the new immune therapies. Um, next, please. So, in 2017, um, we talked about immunomodulators, dual inhibitors, BRAF, PA3K, anti-metabolic agents, and then uh, antitubules and vascular disrupting agent, in particular prenabulin, who I think has this kind of a second life at this moment. And 2018, can you please uh, move the slide? Um, it was a pretty busy um, 
schedule at that time. So we discussed many drugs, including new targeted drugs um, to retin and track, and both of these drugs are approved. Next, please. In 2019, uh, we discussed Keras inhibitors, ADC targeting LRRC15, quite novel target, ATR inhibitors, also other type of immune therapies in combination, including targeted STING and LAG3, uh, use of immune therapy in HIV positive patients. So it's important to discuss that uh, because until then we had no data. Um, next, please. In 2020, um, I had actually three uh, interesting studies, um, a new target agonist of GPR, and then a new way of targeting HER2 with a immunotoxin, and then a new approach on antigen presentation. These studies are still ongoing, um, and they look really promising. So, next slide, please. This time, we're going to touch on adenosine inhibitors and TLR7 agonists, although TLR7 is not a new uh, target. Um, I think we see more agonists in the clinic at this moment. Next slide, please. So, starting with the ad adenosine, adenosine antagonist, this is a study from INSIGHT. Next, please. So, for the background of the role of adenosine in normal physiology, the adenosine pathway plays an important role in maintaining homeostasis of the immune system. So, ATP is actually degraded to uh, lead to extracellular adenosine, or EADO, through the action of cell surface uh, ectonucleosidase CD39 and 73. So, as you can see in this slide, adenosine is released and then has an activity by binding to the receptors A2A and A2B on different target cells and through these target cells induces immune suppression. Next slide, please. In the tumor microenvironment, um, by having high levels of adenosine um, and binding the adenosine to the A2A and A2B receptors that are expressed particularly on T cells, the dendritic cells and macrophages, actually what we see is actually an immune suppression. And this is important because different preclinical studies show that increased flux through this adenosine pathway has been associated with the resistance to immune checkpoint uh, therapies. And then pharmacologic inhibition at different nodes of this adenosine pathway is expected to synergistically reverse the immunosuppressive activity of adenosine. So the NC and INCB10. 6385, it's a novel small molecule antagonist of A2A and A2B receptors. Please, uh, can you move the next slide? In cancer, so what we need to keep in mind is that really the production of adenosine favors escape from anti-tumor immunity and tumor progression um, and really suppresses the anti-tumor uh, activities on the cells and signaling can actually promote cell survival and metastasis, and that was shown in different preclinical studies. So, there's a strong rationale for inhibiting different nodes of this pathway with the aim of completely decreasing the production and signaling. So, this is the drug that we currently have in the clinic. Next slide, please. We don't have clinical data to present yet, but in preclinical um, studies, it was shown that this drug is highly potent antagonist of these receptors. And uh, although it has minimal uh, brain penetration, as you can see in this table, it's, the drug is highly accessible to tumor cells and the tumor to plasma ratio in, is more than one. And if we actually compare with other um, inhibitors of um, A2A and A2B receptors, we can see that actually the binding, it's a low nanomolecular level and um, it's a pretty strong binding to the receptors. Next slide, please. In vivo and in vitro, uh, data are you know, really um, impressive, uh, looking particularly on in vivo efficacy of the INCB 
in the CT26 Synjanaic model, which is a colorectal model, we can see, um, look and follow the day's post inoculation and looking at tumor volume, we see a clear growth inhibition more than 50%. If we look at the um, NGS model, which is actually lacking T cells and B cells and uh, natural killer cells, we see that actually the INCB has no efficacy. So basically demonstrating that the INCB really works on the adenosine pathway and the receptors and the um, cells that have actually the receptors to respond to adenosine um, inhibition. Next slide, please. So um, they actually combine uh, different inhibitors of adenosine with a PD-1 antibody, which um, in this case is retifalimab, um, the, the company has, and as we can see, if we look into um, MLR assays, uh, so mixed lymphocytes reaction assays, we can see the T-activation by measure by interferon production is suppressed um, with the combination, but the most suppression we actually see if we have the triple combination. Um, the other un um, antibody, the, the, the other inside drug, the NCAA00186, is actually a CD73 antibody, so definitely inhibiting another node of the adenosine pathway um, through inhibition of the enzyme. Next slide, please. So this um, slide actually presents the combination, again, of this um, inhibitor of adenosine receptor with the PD-1 and the CD73 antibodies and showing the highest results in the humanized cancer model. So just going you now on the right lower side of the slide, you can see the um, tumor volume with the triple combination and the regressions with more than a half of the um, of the animals. Next slide, please. So basically from preclinical studies, we know that this um, INCB drug, it's a potent dual agonist, uh, antagonist of the adenosine receptors, A2A and A2B, and antagonizes signaling, downstream signaling of these receptors. It restores effector T cell activity um, in the presence of high concentration of adenosine, which mimics in a way the uh, tumor microenvironment, inhibits um, CD26 uh, anti-tumor activity, um, increase in, uh, tumor activity in, uh, in this syngenetic tumor model, and overcomes uh, adenosine-mediated immunosuppression, especially having a higher activity in combination with the PD-1 inhibitor. So, preclinical characterization shows that this drug is uh, a good drug to go to clinical trials, which is currently happening. So, the study has started um, as a phase one first in human, um, and a few patients have been treated, but we don't have enough clinical data to present at this moment. So, thank you for that. So, the next topic is the TLR7 agonist. So, this is a drug from BioNTech. Uh, BioNTech has a great pipeline and also has been fabulous of getting our vaccine together with Pfizer. So, TLR7 is, as I said, is not a new cancer target. It's already known. It's a receptor of the immune system and is especially expressed in endosomes of the peripheral dendritic cells. And I'm sorry, it's not very well visualized. Can you go back for a second? But TLR7 activation induces effector cytokines, enhances effector cells, and enhances tumor microenvironment. Next, please. So, basically, the development of the drugs um, leverages this mechanism of action and having a, a potent immune stimulator either as a monotherapy or in combination with any other cancer therapy, including chemotherapy, which could actually increase the anti-tumor activity and also possibly combination with immune therapies. Next, please. So, again, in preclinical models, what is shown is that um, TLR agonist induces uh, T-cell uh, repolarization of macrophages, so um, it's provoking a reversal of the polarization towards an anti-tumorogenic phenotype, and it activates peripheral dendritic cells. 
and you can follow in this slide on the really uh, right side, the activation of the dendritic cells, it's significantly increased um, when um, the concentration of the drug is increasing and in comparison with uh, just saline. Next, please. What we're also seeing in clinical models is that the drug induces CD8 T cell dependent memory. So on the on the graph A, you see the tumor growth and the T cells are of relevance for the anti-tumor effect of the drug. So there is a clear decrease of the tumor growth with the um, investigational drug. Um, but on B, we can also see that the tumor growth is inhibited even if the um, mouse or the model is rechallenged. So it's the same model, the CT26. So there are long-term survivals developing an anti-tumor memory through this um, TLR7. Next, please. So basically, this drug is intravenously administered. It's a small molecule, has high potency and high selectivity. Um, it also uh, has a type 1 interferon-dominated release of cytokines and chemokines, and as I shown, um, pot potent stimulation of antigen-specific CD8 T cells, B cells, and innate immune cells, such as NK cells and macrophage. So, um, next slide, please. This drug is currently uh, in phase one study in the dose escalation, dose level four. Again, not enough clinical data to present. Um, they'll be probably presented at other meetings, but the primary objective is to assess safety and determine MTD and recommended phase two dose and to establish P a PK profile and evaluate anti-tumor activity. Expansion cohorts will be planned and also a combination with carboplatin and atopazide and also atezolizumab in a small cell lung cancer and eventually other cohorts will be planned. Next slide, please. So, um, I think it's clear that TLR7, it's an ideal target for therapeutic activation of the immune system, has a great potential, um, induces interferon um, alpha from human blood cells at lower concentration compared to pro-inflammatory or regulatory cytokines. This drug is active and it's more active to, uh, compared to other benchmark compounds that try to um, do the same thing to um, be agonist to TLR7. Um, Anti-tumor activity in several mouse models were shown in primary tumor, also metastasis. Synergistic effect were shown also in preclinical models with chemotherapy, uh, drugs, and checkpoint inhibitors. So far, uh, we can say that the toxicity profile is benign and there's no DLT in the first in human trial. And then we look forward to having this drug combined with checkpoint inhibitors and other anti-cancer therapies. So next, please. So as a, like to close here, I will say that we see more and more trials and molecules trying to focus on alternate pathways beyond PD-1, PD-L1 with the goal to improve response rate and eventually efficacy. So I think it's good to have some drugs that are, have an oral administration, it's more convenient, like we've seen the adenosine receptors inhibitor, but we still have no data on the long-term toxicity and is this, are these drugs, uh, you know, really in prime time for chronic administration or not? And obviously we don't have an answer for that, but we see more and more drugs that are, um, helping uh, improving the anti-tumor activity to checkpoint inhibitors. So I'm going to stop here. I think my time is um, is out. Thank you so much. Thank you for that uh, wonderful overview. Uh, very much appreciated. Are there any questions? Um, I, I have one uh, brief question. Um, so, are there um, any specific biomarkers that you think will help um, the development of some of these new molecules? Um, one of the things that I've noted is that, um, especially for new immunotherapy drugs, uh, maybe because the original anti PD1, PDL1 were so successful, there's not a lot of biomarkers that are being explored. Or do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that I, I will say it's lacking in the 
in some of the studies that we see, uh, they all look at you know, again, a tumor mutational burden and dendritic cells and PBMCs, and but not really specific to what the mechanism of action will be. So I, I think again, I need, I think we need more um, technical data for that, but definitely we have to incorporate more of these biomarkers. Yeah, I have seen uh, some of the. You know, some of the drugs like the IDO, DIO, IDO inhibitors, the ICOS mm -hmm. uh, modulators are being, um, uh, you know, abandoned or, uh, and, and I worry that it's a lack of any biomarker there that's doing that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, well, a lot of this new drugs come from industry and I think they want to have the drugs pretty fast in clinical trials. So. They don't incorporate all these um, biomarkers in what they have preclinically, and and the studies eventually don't have that, which is you know has to change. It's eventually something that could be done between an academic industry collaboration, um, and that I think it will be a great idea. Well, thank you again. Um, any other questions? Okay, so I think this wraps it up. Um, I think a lot of exciting things going on in uh, the committee with two new working groups, a lot of new molecules. Uh, DART continues to be an enormous um, success. And I really wanted to thank um, everybody um, who um, has worked so hard to um, really make the committee, um, I think, a big success. Uh, uh, mainly for patients. So thank you. Thank you. Everybody take care. Have a good afternoon. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.